Today's a big day, and you are all very, very welcome. And it would be hard to put into words for this team the journey to get to this day. And I'm not going to do it. We don't really even have the time. We're trying to keep to, I think, 45 minutes, and it's never going to happen. And that's why you got water at the start. Um, but we're going to aim for around 45 minutes. But it has been some journey. And there has been... Um, a lot of turbulence along the way, uh, coupled with a huge amount of support from everybody here and a lot of people that are not here. So there's a lot of people probably, I think, online, um, and hi to them, and also a lot of people who are no longer with us that we need to think about too. We have had some very loyal and faithful companions the whole way through. Um, and there's a few that are really in our minds today, and I wanted to say that at the start, okay? Now, uh, my job on this panel is to speak about the past. So I drew the short end of the stick there, I think. <laughs> but we're going to briefly acknowledge the past, and then we're going to move in towards the future. Today is a wonderful day. And we are on this beautiful site, and we are so lucky to be here. Um, but we do have to acknowledge that this site has a complex history, right? That's very important. I'm going to speak a little bit about survivors, just very briefly, and then we're going to move forward. Um, survivorship is it's a, it's a very complex journey, and um, there are survivors in every room that you go into. It's actually quite common, right? I think it would be very hard to understand some of the things that have happened here um, and that happens, you know, are happening globally, really, without understanding two key pressures on a society. And one is poverty, right? And the other, um, at least here, what the research kind of tells us is a degree of clericalism, okay? These are two of the things that have contributed to some of the things that have happened here. I'm not going to go too far into them because I think we all pretty much understand them. Um, but I do want to highlight that when we take the most vulnerable people in a society and we put them in the care of people who are indemnified, sometimes bad things happen. I don't think that's surprising. And that is the shortest and easiest way that I can kind of interpret that for us, that that's what's happened. Um, so when we think about things like institutional abuse and stuff like that, that's really what occurred. And one of the things I want to say that is you know, kind of interesting, and I've been saying this for years, trying to sort of uh, help people to understand this, but survivors are mad at the church. You know, they are mad at the state. Um, do you know who else they are mad at? Who? They're always mad at themselves. That is something that they work through. They're mad at God. Actually, a lot of them aren't, believe it or not. You'd be surprised. Some people's uh, relationships with God are very intact, which is, you know, counterintuitive, I know, but very true. Do you know the answer? And it's starting to bear out in research. Us. Us. They're mad at society. They're mad at us. What do you think about that? I was trying to explain this to a group of nurses. I was saying, because we do a lot with trauma-informed care, and I was saying, you know, when they come into you, sometimes you'll get power struggles, and you'll get anger, and you'll get all this kind of stuff if they have a history of abuse, particularly institutional abuse. And, you know, I was trying to say, they're mad at you. And one of the nurses said, sure, why would they be mad at us? We didn't do anything. Bingo. We didn't do anything. That's at least their perspective, right? And many of us did try to do things, right? The bottom line is, you know, what occurred in institutions was a, a, a minority of the population, the most vulnerable, and in some cases, some of the most indemnified. There was a majority around that who was supposed to kind of bear witness and step in, and that didn't. And there's a complex sort of a bunch of variables that go on when we don't 
And that's okay, you know, this is humanity. But I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. We're here today because we're trying to do something. You know? We're trying to do something. Um, and it's important to kind of, I think, acknowledge that piece for survivors. Um, I'm working with them all the time. I've been working with them for two decades. And successful survivorship actually usually ends up at that last place. That need to reintegrate and make peace with the society in which they live. I've been saying it for years and it's starting to show up now in research. They have added this fourth and final stage to trauma recovery, which is the confrontation with society. That's us. That's the good news. The good news is that's us. And we can do stuff about that, right? And this is going to be a place where we do stuff about that. Okay, that's all I want to say on it. That's the doom and gloom and the heavy piece. And it's really not that bad, but it's important to acknowledge survivors and the journey because there are things for us to learn from that. Now, when we look back at the past, I think that we have very mixed feelings. You know, some of the feelings are kind of like, we hear a bad story and we kind of go, oh, no more, please, I can't take any more. Please, no more bad church stories. Please, I can't bear another one, right? It's really, really hard. And there are a couple of things that have helped me with this along the way. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the historian Adorno, but he said, and I'm going to apply this to, to, to us in a minute, but he said, a true patriot is someone who has the courage to look at his country and hate it a little bit. The courage to look at his own country that he loves and hate it just a little bit. Hate's a strong word, we'll take hate out of it. We'll say, find certain things unbearable. Right? We have to have the courage to be able to look into the past and say, that's unbearable. When I look at that, I find that unbearable because there is raw energy in that for us to take forward into the future. When you find something unbearable, is it because everything is bad? It's because there are so many things that are good that you love and it feels unbearable that this is ickying it up. Does that make sense? It feels unbearable because of how much you love and how many beautiful things there are to love. And that's why we're here today. Everybody is here today because of all these wonderful things that we love. The rituals, the practices, the clergy, all the beautiful prayers that have been answered. We're full of love, you know? And that's why we're here. Um, so it's important, I think, to acknowledge that. But we have to do both. We have to stare the hard things down so we know how we're going to approach them. And so we know how to approach the hard things in the present as well, by the way. There's a lot of big you know, things going on that we need to be sort of thinking about in the present. A lot of vulnerable people that need to be attended to now. You know, so we have to kind of take those lessons, I think, from the past. I think a true Catholic right now um, is not necessarily someone who's following all the rules or ticking all those boxes. I think it's someone who's looking at the past, feeling a little confounded, feeling like it's really hard because there's all these things I love, but then this past is so difficult to integrate with that. And sitting in that and being confounded, but sticking around. We've all stuck around, haven't we? Because of the things that we love. We're not going anywhere. That's what a true patriot, a true Catholic is. We're still here and full of love, right? Okay. So I have one last little thing I will leave you with, a little anecdote of a survivor that I think is very beautiful and captures why we're here today. Um, there was a laundry that was closing in Dublin, and there was a woman that had been in the laundry for 14 years, and she had recently spoken at the UN <clears throat> about her time in the laundry. And so she was there, and uh, the press were asking her, so what should the state do at this place? You know, what do you want to see happen here? And she was very kind of emotional and very strong emotions and very kind of fired up, probably stimulated. Um, and she said, just burn it to the ground. 
I don't care what you do with it, burn it to the ground, right? Strong feelings, strong emotions, all very fair enough, you know? And everybody was silent because nobody knew what to say. Uh-oh, <laughs> we've stumbled into very uncomfortable territory. Um, and the silence was sort of palpable. And her husband was there beside her, and he had this, you know, pained look on his face, but he was very, very quiet. <clears throat> and maybe you've heard me tell this story before, but he said to her, you love fountains. We could put a fountain here. Would you like to put a fountain here? You know? And that consoled her. That settled her down. I want to be mindful as well of the families who accompany survivors too because they, they bear a lot of these ripple effects. But I want us to think about that because that's really a symbol for what we're doing here. There is a part of us when we see horrible things and we just think, ugh, you know. There's a part of us that wants to burn certain things to the ground. That's a normal response. And today we get to mark, you know, you know, taking this down to the ground a little bit. And that's that's wonderful. We're not taking it down to the ground just for the sake of it. We're taking it down to the ground because there are beautiful things here. And we're going to build many fountains here. And a big building with classrooms and places for people to pray and places for people to learn right? That's the journey from, I'm so mad, I want to burn it to the ground, to maybe we could build a fountain here. You know? There's something lovely in that, isn't there? It was very moving if you had seen it. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bear the tension of that and build, create. That's what we're here to do, right? Okay. I think that's it. I think that's all I had to say. Um, what I also want to say is, I know there are many people here who have wonderful memories of this place because of all the wonderful things that have happened here. Um, and we're so glad you're here. And there are going to be so many more wonderful things that go on here. So that's it. That is all from me. That was the heavy piece. The rest gets a lot lighter. Now, uh, next we have Jim Tui. How to introduce Jim Tui. I'll let you look at his bio. Um, it's pretty impressive. And when Jim is not advising presidents and saints and running around the states collecting his doctorates, um, he is very generous with his time and has been a massive support to everybody here and to this team. Uh, and we're very grateful to have his companionship on this journey. And I think he's got some really lovely things to tell us about uh, his experiences along the way, too.